Story five of the Doom of London. Six stories by Fred M. White. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Invisible Force. A story of what might happen in the days to come, when underground London is tunnelled in all directions for electric railways, if an explosion should take place in one of the tubes. 1. It seemed as if London had solved one of her great problems at last. The communication difficulty was at an end. The first-class ticket-holders no longer struggled to and from business with fourteen fellow-sufferers in a third-class carriage. There were no longer any particularly favoured suburbs, nor were there isolated localities where it took as long getting to the city as an express train takes between London and Swindon. The pleasing paradox of a man living at Brighton because it was nearer to his business than Surbiton had ceased to exist. The tubes had done away with all that. There were at least a dozen hollow cases running under London in all directions. They were cool and well ventilated, the carriages were brilliantly lighted, the various loops were properly equipped and managed. All day long the shining tunnels and bright platforms were filled with passengers. Towards midnight the traffic grew less, and by half-past one o'clock the last train had departed. The all-night service was not yet. It was perfectly quiet now along the gleaming core that lay buried under Bond Street and St. James Street, forming the loop running below the Thames close by Westminster Bridge Road, and thence to the crowded Newington and Walworth districts. Here a portion of the roof was under repair. The core was brightly lighted. There was no suggestion of fog or gloom. The general use of electricity had disposed of a good deal of London's murkiness. Electric motors were applied now to most manufactories and workshops. There was just as much gas consumed as ever, but it was principally used for heating and culinary purposes. Electric radiators and cookers had not yet reached the multitude. That was a matter of time. In the flare of the blue arc lights a dozen men were working on the dome of the core. Something had gone wrong with a water main overhead. The concrete beyond the steel belt had cracked, and the moisture had corroded the steel plates, so that a long strip of the metal skin had been peeled away, and the friable concrete had fallen on the rails. It had brought part of the crown with it, so that a maze of large and small pipes was exposed to view. "'They look like the reeds of an organ,' a raw engineer's apprentice remarked to the foreman. "'What are they?' "'Gas mains, water, electric light, telephone, goodness knows what,' the foreman replied. "'They branch off here, you see.' "'Fun to cut them,' the apprentice grinned. The foreman nodded absently. He had once been a mischievous boy, too. The job before him looked a bigger thing than he had expected. It would have to be patched up till a strong gang could be turned on to the work. The raw apprentice was still gazing at the knot of pipes. What fun it would be to cut that water main and flood the tunnels! In an hour the scaffolding was done, and the debris cleared away. Tomorrow night a gang of men would come and make the concrete good and restore the steel rim to the dome. The tube was deserted. It looked like a polished hollow needle, lighted here and there by points of dazzling light. It was so quiet and deserted that the falling of a big stone reverberated along the tube with a hollow sound. There was a crack, and a section of pipe gave way slightly and pressed down upon one of the electric mains. A tangled skein of telephone wires followed. Under the strain the electric cable parted and snapped. There was a long, sliding blue flame, and instantly the tube was in darkness. A short circuit had been established somewhere. Not that it mattered, for traffic was absolutely suspended now, and would not be resumed again before daylight. Of course, there were the workmen's very early trains, and the Covent Garden market trains, but they did not run over this section of the line. The whole darkness reeked with the whiff of burning India rubber. The moments passed on drowsily. Along one side of Bond Street the big lamps were out. All the lights on one main switch had gone, but it was past one o'clock now, and the thing mattered little. These accidents occurred sometimes in the best-regulated districts, 
and the defect would be made good in the morning. It was a little awkward, though, for a great state ball was in progress at Buckingham Palace. Supper was over, the magnificent apartments were brilliant with lighted dresses and gay uniforms. The shimmer and fret of diamonds flashed back to lights dimmer than themselves. There was a slide of feet over the polished floors. Then, as if some unseen force had cut the bottom of creation, light and gaiety ceased to be, and darkness fell like a curtain. There were a few cries of alarm from the swift suddenness of it. To eyes accustomed to that brilliant glow, the gloom was Egyptian. It seemed as if some great catastrophe had happened. But common sense reasserted itself, and the brilliant gathering knew that the electric light had failed. There were quick commands, and spots of yellow flame sprang out here and there in the great desert of the night. How faint and feeble and yellow and flaring the lights looked! The electrician down below was puzzled, for, as far as he could see, the fuses in the meters were intact. There was no short circuit so far as the palace was concerned. In all probability there had been an accident at the generating stations. In a few minutes the mischief would be repaired. But time passed, and there was no welcome return of the flood of crystal light. "'It is a case for all the candles,' the Lord Chamberlain remarked. "'Fortunately the old chandeliers are all fitted. Light the candles!' It was a queer, grotesque scene, with all that wealth of diamonds and glitter of uniforms and gloss of satins, under the dim suggestion of the candles. And yet it was enjoyable from the very novelty of it. Nothing could be more appropriate for the minuet that was in progress. "'I feel like one of my own ancestors,' a noble lord remarked. "'When they hit upon that class of candle, I expect they imagined that the last possibility in the way of lighting had been accomplished. Is it the same outside, Sir George?' Sir George Edgerton laughed. He was fresh from the gardens. "'It's patchwork,' he said. So far as I can judge, London appears to be lighted in sections. I expect there is a pretty bad breakdown. My dear chap, do you mean to say that clock is right? Half past four, sure enough, and mild for the time of year. Did you notice a kind of rumbling under? Merciful heavens, what is that? Two. There was a sudden splitting crack, as if a thousand rifles had been discharged in the ballroom. The floor rose on one side to a perilous angle, considering the slippery nature of its surface. Such a shower of white flakes fell from the ceiling, that dark dresses and naval uniforms looked as if their wearers had been out in a snowstorm. Cracks and fissures started in the walls with pantomimic effect. On all sides could be heard the rattle and splinter of falling glass. A voice suddenly uprose in a piercing scream, a yell proclaiming that one of the great crystal chandeliers was falling. There was a rush and a rustle of skirts, and a quick vision of white, beautiful faces, and with a crash the great pendant came to the floor. The whole world seemed to be oscillating under frightened feet. The palace was humming and thrumming like a harp-string. The panic was so great, the whole mysterious tragedy so sudden, that the bravest there had to battle for their wits. Save for a few solitary branches of candles, the big room was in darkness. There were fifteen hundred of England's bravest and fairest and best, huddled together in what might be a hideous death-chamber, for all they knew to the contrary. Women were clinging in terror to the men, the fine lines of class distinction were broken down. All were poor humanity now, in the presence of a common danger. In a little time the earth ceased to sway and rock, the danger was passing. A little colour was creeping back to the white faces again. Men and women were conscious that they could hear the beating of their own hearts. Nobody broke the silence yet, for speech seemed to be out of place. "'An earthquake,' somebody said at length. "'An earthquake, beyond doubt, and a pretty bad one at that.' That accounts for the failure of the electric light. There will be some bad accidents if the gas mains are disturbed. The earth grew steady underfoot again. The white flakes ceased to fall. Amongst the men the spirit of adventure was rising. The idea of standing quietly there and doing nothing was out of the question. Anyway, there could be no further thought of pleasure that night. 
There were many mothers there, and their uppermost thought was for home. Never, perhaps, in the history of royalty had there been so informal a breaking up of a great function. The king and queen had retired some little time before, a kindly and thoughtful act under the circumstances. The women were cloaking and shawling hurriedly. They crowded out in search of their carriages, with no more order than would have been obtained outside a theatre. But there were remarkably few carriages in waiting. An idiotic footman, who had lost his head in the sudden calamity, sobbed out the information that Oxford Street and Bond Street were impassable, and that houses were down in all directions. No vehicles could come that way. The road was destroyed. As to the rest, the man knew nothing. He was frightened out of his life. There was nothing for it but to walk. It wanted two good hours yet before dawn, but thousands of people seemed to be abroad. For a space of a mile or more there was not a light to be seen. Round Buckingham Palace the atmosphere reeked with a fine irritating dust, and was rendered foul and poisonous by the fumes of coal gas. There must have been a fearful leakage somewhere. Nobody seemed to know what was the matter, and everybody was asking everybody else, and in the darkness it was very hard to locate the disaster. Generally it was admitted that London had been visited by a dreadful earthquake. Never were the daylight hours awaited more eagerly. "'The crack of doom!' Sir Edgerton remarked to his companion, Lord Barcombe. They were feeling their way across the park in the direction of the mall. "'It's like a shuddering romance that I read a little time since, but I must know something about it before I go to bed. Let's try St. James Street, if there's any St. James Street left.' "'All right,' Lord Barcombe agreed. "'I hope the clubs are safe. Is it wise to strike a match with all this gas reeking in the air?' "'Anything's better than the gas,' Sir George said tersely. The vesta flared out in a narrow purple circle. Beyond it was a glimpse of a seat, with two or three people huddled on it. They were outcasts and companions in the grip of misfortune, but they were all awake now. "'Can any of you say what's happened?' Lord Barcombe asked. "'The world's come to an end, sir, I believe,' was the broken reply. "'You may say what you like, but it was a tremendous explosion. I saw a light like all the world ablaze over to the north, and then all the lights went out, and I've been waiting for the last trumpet to sound ever since. "'Then you didn't investigate?' Lord Barcombe asked. "'Not me, sir. I seem to have struck a bit of solid earth where I am. And then it rained stones and pieces of brick and vestiges of creation. There's the half of a boiler close to you that dropped out of the sky, you stay where you are, sir. But the two young men pushed on. They reached what appeared to be St. James Street at length, but only by stumbling and climbing over heaps of debris. The roadway was one mass of broken masonry. The fronts of some of the clubs had been stripped off as if a titanic knife had sliced them. It was like looking into one of the upholsterer's smart shops, where they display rooms completely furnished. There were gaps here and there where houses had collapsed altogether. Seeing that the road had ceased to exist, it seemed impossible that an earthquake could have done this thing. A great light flickered and roared a little way down the road. At an angle a gas main was tilted up like the spout of a teapot, heaved and snapped from its twin pipes. This had caught fire in some way, so that for a hundred yards or so each way the thoroughfare was illuminated by a huge flare lamp. It was a thrilling sight focused in that blue glare. It looked as if London had been utterly destroyed by a siege, as if thousands of well-aimed shells had exploded. Houses looked like tattered banners of brick and mortar. Heavy articles of furniture had been hurled into the street. On the other hand, little gimcrack ornaments still stood on tiny brackets. A scared-looking policeman came staggering along. "'My man!' Lord Barcombe cried. What has happened? The officer pulled himself together and touched his helmet. It's dreadful, sir, he sobbed. There has been an accident in the tubes, and they have been blown all to pieces. 3. The constable, for the moment, had utterly lost his nerve. He stood there in the great flaring roar of the gas mains with a dazed expression that was pitiful. 
"'Can you tell us anything about it?' Lord Barcombe asked. "'I was in Piccadilly,' was the reply. "'Everything was perfectly quiet, and so far as I could see not a soul was in sight. Then I heard a funny rushing sound, just like the tear of an express train through a big empty station. Yes, it was for all the world like a ghostly express train that you could hear and not see. It came nearer and nearer. The whole earth trembled just as if the train had gone mad in Piccadilly. It rushed past me down St. James's Street, and after that there was an awful smash and a bang, and I was lying on my back in the middle of the road. All the lights that remained went out, and for a minute or two I was in that railway collision. Then when I got my senses back I blundered down here because of that big flaring light there. And I can't tell you gentlemen any more, except that the tube has blown up." On that fact there was no question. There were piles of debris thrown high in one part, and a long deep depression in another, like a ruined dike. A little further on, the steel core of the tube lay bare with rugged holes ripped in it. "'Some ghastly electric catastrophe,' Sir George Edgerton murmured. It was getting light by this time, and it was possible to form some idea of the magnitude of the disaster. Some of the clubs in St. James's Street still appeared to be intact, but others had suffered terribly. The heaps of tumbled masonry were powdered and glittering with broken glass, and a few walls hung perilously over the pavement. And still the gas main roared on until the flame grew purple to violet and to straw color before the coming dawn. If this same thing had happened all along the network of tubes, London would be more or less a hideous ruin. For the better part of Piccadilly things were brighter. Evidently the explosion had had a straight run here, for the road had been raised like some mighty zigzag molehill for many yards. The wood pavement scattered all over the place suggested a gigantic box of child's bricks strewn over a nursery floor. The tube had been forced up, its outer envelope of concrete broken so that the now twisted steel core might have been a black snake crawling down Piccadilly. Doubtless the expanding air had met with some obstacle in the tube under St. James's Street, hence the terrible force of the explosion there. There was quite a large crowd in Oxford Street. The whole roadway was wet. The gutters ran with the water from the broken pipes. The air was full of the odour of gas. All the clocks in the streets seemed to have gone mad. Lord Barcombe glanced at his own watch to find that it was racing furiously. "'By Jove!' he whispered excitedly. "'We're in danger here. The air is full of electricity. I went over some works once and neglected to leave my watch behind me, and it played me the same prank. It affects the mainspring, you know. There were great ropes and coils of electric wire of high voltage cropping out of the ground here and there. Coils attached to huge accumulators and discharging murderous current freely. A dog, picking his way across the sopping street, trod on one of the wires, and instantly all that remained of the dog was what looked like a twisted bit of burnt skin and bone. It appealed to Sir George Edgerton's imagination strongly. "'Poor little brute!' he murmured. "'It might have happened to you or me. Don't you know that a force that only gives a man a bad shock when he is standing on dry ground often kills him when the surface is wet? I wonder if we can get some India rubber gloves and galoshes hereabouts. After that gruesome sight I shall be afraid to put one foot before the other.' Indeed the precaution was a necessary one. A horse attached to a cab came creeping over the blocked streets. The animal slipped on a grating connected with the ventilation of the drains, and a fraction of a second later there was no horse in existence. The driver sat on his perch, white and scared. "'The galoshes,' Lord Barcombe said hoarsely. "'Don't you move till we come back again, my man. And everybody keep out of the roadway.' The cry ran along the roadway meant instant death. The cabin man sat there gibbering with terror. A little way further down was a rubber warehouse with a fine selection of waiters and electricians' gloves in the window. 
With a fragment of concrete, Sir George smashed the window and took what he and Lord Barcombe required. They knew that they would be quite safe now. More dead than alive, the cabman climbed down from his seat and was carried to the pavement on Lord Barcombe's shoulder. The left side of his face was all drawn up and puckered, the left arm was useless. "'Apoplexy from the fright,' Sir George suggested. "'Not a bit of it,' Lord Barcombe exclaimed. "'It's a severe electric shock. Hold up!' Gradually the man's face and arm ceased to twitch. "'If that's been struck by lightning,' he said, "'I don't want another dose. It was as if something had caught hold of me and frozen my heart in my body. I couldn't do a thing. And look at my coat!' All up the left side the coat was singed, so that at a touch the whole cloth fell to pieces. It was a strange instance of the freakishness of the invisible force. A great fear fell on those who saw. This intangible, unseen danger, with its awful swiftness, was worse than the worst that could be seen. "'Let's get home,' Lord Barcombe suggested. "'It's getting on my nerves. It's dreadful, when all the terror is left to the imagination." 4. Meanwhile, no time was lost in getting to the root of the mischief. The danger could not be averted by switching off the power altogether at the various electrical stations of the metropolis. At intervals along the tubes were immense accumulators which for the present could not be touched. It was these accumulators that rendered the streets such a ghastly peril. It was the electrical expert to the county council, Alton Rossiter, who first got on the track of the disaster. More than once before, the contact between gas and electricity had produced minor troubles of this kind. Gas that had escaped into manholes and drains had been fired from the sparks caused by a short-circuit current wire. For some time, even as far back as 1895, instances of this kind had been recorded. But how could the gas have leaked into the tube, seeing that it was a steel core with a solid bedding of concrete beyond? Unless an accident had happened when the tube was under repair, this seemed impossible. The manager of the associated tubes was quite ready to afford every information to Mr. Rossiter. The core had corroded in Bond Street in consequence of a settling of the earth caused by a leaky water main. The night before, this had been located, and the steel skin stripped off for the necessary repairs. Mr. Alton Rossiter cut the speaker short. "'Will you come to Bond Street with me, Mr. Ferguson?' he said. "'We may be able to get into the tunnel there.' Ferguson was quite ready. The damage in Bond Street was not so great, though the lift shaft was filled with debris, and it became necessary to cut away into the station before the tunnel was reached. For a couple of hundred yards the tube was intact. Beyond that point the fumes of gas were overpowering. A long strip of steel hung from the roof. Just where it was, a round, clean hole in the roadway rendered it possible to work and breathe there in spite of the gas fumes. "'We shall have to manage as best we can,' Rossiter muttered. For a little time, at any rate, the gas of London must be cut off entirely. With broken mains all over the place, the supply is positively dangerous. Look here." He pointed to the spot where the gas main had trended down, and where a short-circuit wire had fused it. Here was the whole secret in a nutshell. A roaring gas main had poured a dense volume into the tube for hours. Mixed with the air, it had become one of the most powerful and deadly of explosives. "'What time does your first train start?' Rossiter asked. "'For the early markets, four o'clock,' Ferguson replied. "'In other words, we switch on the current from the accumulator stations at twenty minutes to four. "'And this is one of your generating stations?' "'Yes, of course. I see exactly what you are driving at. Practically the whole circuit of tubes was more or less charged with a fearful admixture of gas and air. As soon as the current was switched on, a spark exploded the charge. I fear, I very much fear, that you are right. If we can only find the man in charge here. But that would be nothing else than a miracle. 
All the same the operator in charge of the switches was close by. Fortunately for him, the current in the tube had carried the gases towards St. James's Street. The explosion had lifted him out of his box, and for a time he lay stunned. Dazed and confused, he had climbed to the street, and staggered into the shop of a chemist who was just closing the door upon a customer who had rung him up for a prescription. But he could say very little. There had been an explosion directly he pulled down the first of the switches, and his memory was a blank after that. Anyway, the cause of the disaster was found. To prevent further catastrophe, notice was immediately given to the various gas companies to cut off the supplies at once. In a little time the whole disastrous length of the tube was free from that danger. By the afternoon a committee had gone over the whole route. At the first blush it looked as if London had been half ruined. It was impossible yet to estimate the full extent of the damage. In St. James's Street alone the loss was pretty certain to run into millions. Down in Whitehall and Parliament Street, and by Westminster Bridge, the damage was terrible. Here sharp curves and angles had checked the rush of expanding air with the most dire results. Huge holes and ruts had been made in the earth, and houses had come down bodily. Most of the people out in the streets by this time were properly equipped in India rubber shoes and gloves. It touched the imagination strongly to know that between a man and hideous death was a thin sheet of rubber no thicker than a shilling. It was like walking over the crust of a slumbering volcano, like skating at top speed over very thin ice. Towards the evening a thrilling whisper ran round. From Detford, two early specials had started to convey an annual excursion of five hundred men and their wives to Paddington, whence they were going to Windsor. It seemed impossible, incredible, that these could have been overlooked. But by five o'clock the dreadful truth was established. Those two specials had started. But what oblivion they had found! How lingering, swift, or merciful, nobody could tell. Five. There was a new horror. The story of those early special trains gave final terror to the situation. Probably they had been blown to eternity. There was just one chance in a million that anybody had escaped. All the same, something would have to be done to put the matter at rest. Nobody knew what to do. Everybody had lost their heads for the moment. It seemed hopeless from the very start. Naturally, the man that everybody looked to at the moment was Ferguson of the Associated Tubes. With him was Alton Rossiter, representing the county council. But how to make a start? the latter asked. We will start from Deptford, said Ferguson. We must first ascertain the exact time that the train left Deptford, and the precise moment when the first explosion took place. Mind you, I believe there was a series of explosions. You see, there is always a fair amount of air in the tubes. When the inflowing gas met the cross-currents of air, it would be diverted, or pocketed, so to speak. We should have a big pocket of the explosive, followed by a clear space. When the switches were turned on, there would be sparks here and there all along the tubes. This means that practically simultaneously the mines would be fired, so quickly that the series of reports would sound like one big bang. That this must be so can be seen by the state of some of the streets. In some spots the tube has been wrenched bodily from the earth as easily as if it had been a gas-pipe. And then again you have streets that do not show the slightest damage. You must agree with me that my theory is a correct one. I do, but what are you driving at? Well, I am afraid that my theory is a very forlorn one, but I give it for what it is worth. It's just possible, faintly possible, that those trains ran into a portion of the tube where there was no explosion at all. There were explosions behind them and in front of them, and of course the machinery would have been rendered useless instantly, so that the trains may be trapped with no ingress or outlet. I am not in the least sanguine of finding anything, but the aftermath of a fearful tragedy. Anyway, our duty is pretty plainly before us. We must go to Deptford. Come along." The journey to Deptford was no easy one. 
There were so many streets up that locomotion was a difficult matter, and where the streets were damaged there was danger. It was possible to use cycles, seeing that the rubber tires formed non-conductors, and india-rubber gloves and shoes allowed extra protection. But the mere suggestion of a spill was thrilling. It might mean the tearing of a glove or the loss of a shoe, and then, well, that did not bear thinking about. I never before properly appreciated the feelings of the man that Blondin used to carry on his back, Rossiter said, as the pair pushed steadily through Bermondsey. But I can understand his emotions now. The roads, even where there was no danger, were empty. A man or woman would venture timidly out and look longingly to the other side of the road, and then give up the idea of moving altogether. As a matter of fact, there was more of it safe than otherwise, but the risks were too awful. 6. Meanwhile something like an organized attempt was being made to grapple with the evil. Days must, of necessity, elapse before a proper estimate of the damage could be made, to say nothing of the loss of life. Nothing very great could be accomplished, however, until the huge accumulators had been cleared and the deadly current switched off. So far as the London area proper was concerned, Holborn Viaduct was the point to aim at. In big vaults there, underground, were some of the largest accumulators in the world. These would have to be rendered harmless at any cost. But the work was none so easy, seeing that the tube here was crushed and twisted, and all about it was a knot of high-pressure cables deadly to the touch. There was enough power here, running to waste, to destroy a city. There were spaces that it was impossible to cross, and unfortunately the danger could not be seen. There was no warning, no chance of escape for the too hardy adventurer. He would just have stepped an inch beyond the region of safety, and there would have been an end of him. No wonder that the willing workers hesitated. There was nothing for it but the blasting of the tube. True, this might be attended with danger to such surrounding buildings as had weathered the storm, but it was the desperate hour for desperate remedies. A big charge of dynamite rent a long slit in the exposed length of tube, and a workman taking his life in his hands entered the opening. There were few spectators watching. It was too gruesome and horrible to stand there with the feeling that a slip either way might mean sudden death. The workman, swathed from head to foot in India rubber, disappeared from sight. It seemed a long time before he returned, so long that his companions gave him up for lost. Those strong able men who were ready to face any ordinary danger looked at one another askance. Fire or flood or gas they would have endured, for under those circumstances the danger was tangible. But here was something that appealed horribly to the imagination. And such a death! the instantaneous fusion of the body to a dry, charcoal crumb. But presently a grimed head looked out of the funnel. The face was white behind the dust, but set and firm. The pioneer called for lights. So far he had been successful. He had found the accumulators buried under a heap of refuse. They were built into solid concrete below the level of the tube, so that they had not suffered to any appreciable extent. There was no longer any holding back. The party swung along the tube with lanterns and candles flaring. They reached the vault where the great accumulators were situated. Under the piled rails and fragments of splintered wood, the shining marble switchboard could be seen. But to get to it was quite another matter. Once this was accomplished, one of the greatest dangers and horrors that paralyzed labor would be removed. It was too much to expect that the average labourer would toil willingly, or even toil at all when the moving of an inch might mean instant destruction, and it was such a little thing to do after all. A child could have accomplished it. The pressure of a finger or two, the tiny action that disconnects a wire from the live power, and the danger would be no more, and the automatic accumulators rendered harmless but here were a few men, at any rate, who did not mean to be defeated. They toiled on willingly, and yet with the utmost caution, for the knots of cable-wire under their feet and over their heads were like brambles in the forest. 
If one of these had given way, all of them might be destroyed. It was the kind of work that causes the scalp to rise, and the heart to beat, and the body to perspire, even on the coldest day. Now and then a cable upheld by some debris would slip. There would be a sudden cry, and the workmen would skip back, breathing heavily. It was like working a mine filled with rattlesnakes asleep but gradually the mass of matter was cleared away and the switchboard disclosed. A few light touches and a large area of London was free from a terrible danger. It was possible now to handle the big cables with impunity, for they were perfectly harmless. There was no word spoken for a long time. The men were trembling with the reaction. One of them produced a large flask of brandy and handed it round. Not till they had all drunk, did the leader of the expedition speak. "'How many years since yesterday morning?' he asked. "'Makes one feel like an old man,' another muttered. They climbed presently into the street again, for there was nothing to be done here for the present. A few adventurous spectators heard the news that the streets were free from danger once more. The tidings spread in the marvellous way that such rumour carries, and in a little time the streets were packed with people. 7. When the two cyclists came to Deptford, they found that comparatively little damage had been done to the station there, beyond that the offices and platforms had been wrecked. A wounded man was found, who described how a mighty hurricane had roared down the tube ten minutes after the excursion trains had departed. Ferguson made a rapid calculation from the figures that the man supplied. "'The trains must have been near to Park Road Station,' he said, when the explosion occurred. "'There is just a chance that they may have run into a space free from gas, and that the explosion passed them altogether. Let us make for Park Road Station without delay, and we must try to pick up some volunteers as we go along.' When they arrived at the scene they found that a big crowd had gathered. A rumour had spread that feeble voices had been heard down one of the ventilation gratings, calling for help. Ferguson and Rossiter reached the spot with difficulty. "'Get our fellows together,' whispered Ferguson. "'We can work now with impunity, and if any of those poor people down below are alive, we shall have them out in half an hour. If we only had some lights! Beg, borrow, or steal all the lanterns you can get!' The nearest police station solved that problem fast enough. A small gang of special experts moved upon Park Road Station while the mob was still struggling about the ventilation shaft, and in a little time the entrance was forced. The station was a veritable wreck, but for two hundred yards the tunnel was clear before them. Then came a jammed wall of timber, the end of a railway carriage standing on end. The timbers were twisted, huge balks of wood were bent like a bow. A way was soon made through the debris, and Ferguson yelled aloud. To his delight a hoarse voice answered him. He yelled again and waved his lantern. Out of the velvety darkness of the tube a man staggered into the lane of light made by the lantern. He was a typical thick-set workman in his best clothes. "'So you found us at last,' he said dully. He appeared to be past all emotions. His eyes showed no gratitude, no delight. The horrors of the dark hours had numbed his senses. "'Is... is it very bad?' asked Rossiter. "'Many were killed,' the newcomer said in the same wooden voice. "'But the others are sitting in the carriages, waiting for the end to come. The lights in the carriages helped us a bit, but after the first hour they went out.' Then one or two of us went up the line till it seemed to rise and twist as if it was going to climb into the sky, and by that we guessed that there had been a big explosion of some kind. So we tried the other way, and that was all blocked up with timber. And we knew then. The electricity was about, and, well, it wasn't a pretty sight, so we went back to the trains. When the lights went out, we were all mad for a time, and... and... The speaker's lips quivered and shook. He burst into a torrent of tears. Rossiter patted him on the back approvingly. Those tears probably staved off stark insanity. 
the light of the lanterns went swinging on ahead now and the trains began to pour out their freight of half-dead people there were some with children who huddled back fearfully in their corners and refused to face the destruction which they were sure lay before them they were all white and trembling with quivering lips and eyes that twitched strangely heaven only knows how long an eternity those hours of darkness had seemed they were all out at last and were gently led to blessed light again there were doctors on the spot by this time with nourishing food and stimulants for the most part the women sat down and cried quietly hugging their children to their breasts some of the men were crying in the same dull way but a few were violent the dark horror of it had driven them mad for the time but there was a darker side to it of the pleasure-seekers the dead were numbered at more than half but there was one man here and there who had kept his head throughout the crisis a cheerful-looking sailor gave the best account of the adventure not that there is much to say he remarked we got on just as usual for the first ten minutes or so the train running smoothly and plenty of light then all at once we came to a sudden stop that sent us flying across the carriage we seemed to have gone headlong into the stiffest tempest i ever met you could hear the wind go roaring past the carriages and then it stopped as soon as it had begun the rattle of broken glass was like musketry the first thing i saw when i got out was the dead body of the engine driver with the stoker close by it was just the same with the train in front afterwards i tried to find a way out but couldn't there was a man with me who trod on some of them cables as you call em and the next instant there was no man but i don't want to talk of that it means months upon months ferguson said sadly not months years rossiter replied yet i dare say that in the long run we shall benefit by the calamity great communities do as to calculating the damage my imagination only goes as far as fifty millions and then stops and yet if anybody had suggested this to me yesterday morning i should have laughed it would have seemed impossible absolutely impossible and yet now that it has come about how easy and natural it all seems come let us get to work and try to forget. End of story five. Story six of the Doom of London by Fred M. White. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The River of Death. One. The sky was as brass from the glowing east upwards, a stifling heat radiated from stone and wood and iron, a close, reeking heat that drove one back from the very mention of food. The five million-odd people that go to make up London, even in the cream of the holiday season, panted and gasped and prayed for the rain that never came. For the first three weeks in August, the furnace fires of the sun poured down till every building became a vapour bath with no suspicion of a breeze to temper the fierceness of it even the cheap press had given up sunstroke statistics the heat seemed to have wilted up the journalists and their superlatives more or less the drought had lasted since april tales came up from the provinces of stagnant rivers and quick fell spurts of zymotic diseases for a long time past the london water companies had restricted their supplies still there was no suggestion of alarm nothing as yet looked like a water famine the heat was almost unbearable but people said the wave must break soon and the metropolis would breathe again professor owen derbyshire shook his head as he looked at the brassy star-powdered sky he crawled homewards towards harley street with his hat in his hand and his grey frock coat showing a wide expanse of white shirt below there was a buzz of electric fans in the hall of number four eleven a murmur of them overhead and yet the atmosphere was hot and heavy there was one solitary light in the dining-room a room all sombre oak and dull red walls as befitted a man of science and a visiting card glistened on the table derbyshire read the card with a gesture of annoyance 
James P. Chase. Morning Telephone. I'll have to see him, the professor groaned. I'll have to see the man if only to put him off. Is it possible these confounded pressmen have got hold of the story already? With just a suggestion of anxiety on his strong, clean-shaven face, the professor parted the velvet curtains leading to a kind of study laboratory, the sort of place you would expect to find in the house of a man whose specialty is the fighting of disease in bulk. Derbyshire was the one man who could grapple with an epidemic, the one man always sent for. The constant pestering of newspaper men was no new thing. Doubtless Chase aforesaid was merely plunging around after sensations, journalistic curry for the hot weather. Still, the pushing little American might have stumbled on the truth. Derbyshire took down his telephone and churned the handle. "'Are you there? Yes. Give me 30795, Kensington.' "'That you, Longdale?' "'Yes, it's Derbyshire. Step round here at once, will you? Yes, I know it's hot, and I wouldn't ask you to come if it wasn't a matter of the last importance.' A small thin voice promised as desired, and Derbyshire hung up his receiver. He then lighted a cigarette, and proceeded to con over some notes that he had taken from his pocket. These he elaborated in pencil in a small but marvellously clear handwriting. As he lay back in his chair, he did not look much like the general, whose army is absolutely surrounded, but he was. And that square, lean head held a secret that would have set London almost mad at a whisper. Derbyshire laid the sheets down, and fell into a reverie. He was roused presently by the hall bell, and Dr. Longdale entered. The professor brightened. "'That's right,' he said. "'Good to see somebody, Longdale. I've had an awful day. Verity, if Mr. Chase comes again, ask him in here.' "'Mr. Chase said he would return in an hour, sir,' the large butler replied. "'And I'm to show him in here? Yes, sir.' but already Derbyshire had hustled his colleague beyond the velvet curtains. Longdale's small clear figure was quivering with excitement. His dark eyes fairly blazed behind a pair of gold-rimmed spectacles. "'Well,' he gasped, "'I suppose it's come at last?' "'Of course it has,' Derbyshire replied. "'Sooner or later it was an absolute certainty. Day by day for a month I have watched the sky and wondered where the black hand would show.' and when these things do come, they strike where you most dread them. Still, in this case, the Thames—' "'Absolutely pregnant!' Longdale exclaimed. "'Roughly speaking, four-fifths of London's water supply comes from the Thames. How many towns, villages drain into the river before it reaches Sunbury, or thereabouts, where most of the water companies have their intake? Why, scores of them!' and for the best part of a month the Thames has been little better than a ditch, stagnating under a brazen sunshine. Will our people ever learn anything, Derbyshire? Is London and its six million people always to groan under the tyranny of a monopoly? Say there's an outbreak of typhoid somewhere up the river, between here and Oxford. It gets a grip before the thing is properly handled. The village system of drainage is a mere matter of percolation. In eight and forty hours the Thames is one floating tank of deadly poison. And, mind you, this thing is bound to happen sooner or later. It has happened, Derbyshire said quietly, and in a worse form than you think. Just listen to this extract from an eastern county's provincial paper. Strange Affair at Aldenburg A day or two ago the bark Santa Anna came ashore at Spur, near Aldenburg, and quickly became a total wreck. The vessel was piled high on the spur, and, the strong tide acting upon the worn-out hull, quickly beat it to pieces. The crew of eight men presumably took to their boats, for nothing has been seen of them since. How the Santa Anna came to be wrecked on a clear, calm night remains a mystery for the present. The bark was presumably inbound for some foreign port, and laden with oranges, thousands of which have been picked up at Aldenburg lately. The coast guards presume the bark to be a Portuguese. "'Naturally you want to know what this has to do with the Thames,' Derbyshire observed. "'I'm going to tell you. The Santa Anna was deliberately wrecked, for a purpose you will see later.' 
the crew for the most part landed not far away and for reasons of their own sank their boat it isn't far from aldenburg to london in a short time the portuguese were in the metropolis two or three of them remained there and five of them proceeded to tramp to ashchurch which is on the river and not far from oxford being short of money their idea was to tramp across to cardiff and get a ship there being equally short of our language they get out of their way to ashchurch then three of them are taken ill and two of them die the local practitioner sends for the medical officer of health the latter gets frightened and sends for me i have just got back look here derbyshire produced a phial of cloudy fluid some of which he proceeded to lay on the glass of a powerful microscope longdale fairly staggered back from the eyepiece bubonic the water reeks with the bacillus i haven't seen it so strongly marked since we were in new orleans together derbyshire you don't mean to say that this sample came from the thames but i do ashchurch drains directly into the river and for some few days those sailors have been suffering from a gross form of bubonic fever now you see why they ran the santa anna ashore and deserted her one of the crew died of plague and the rest abandoned her we won't go into the hideous selfishness of it it was a case of the devil take the hindmost it's an awful thing longdale groaned frightful derbyshire murmured he was vaguely experimenting with some white precipitate on a little water taken from the phial. He placed a small electric battery on the table. The great bulk of the London water supply comes from the Thames. Speaking from memory, only the New River and one other company draw their supply from the Lee. If the supply were cut off, places like Hoxton and Haggerstone and Battersea, in fact all the dense centres of population where disease is held in on the slenderest of threads would suffer fearfully and there is that deadly poison spreading and spreading hourly drawing nearer to the metropolis into which presently it will be ladled by the million gallons people will wash in it drink in it mayfair will take its chance with whitechapel at any hazard the supply must be cut off longdale cried and deprive four-fifths of london of water altogether derbyshire said grimly and london grilling like a furnace no flushing of sewers no watering of roads not even a drop to drink in two days london would be a reeking seething hell try and picture it longdale i have often longdale said gloomily sooner or later it had to come now is your chance derbyshire that process of sterilization of yours derbyshire smiled he moved in the direction of the velvet curtains he wanted those notes of his he wanted to prove a startling new discovery to his colleague the notes were there but they seemed to have been disturbed on the floor lay a torn sheet from a notebook with shorthand cipher thereon derbyshire flew to the bell and rang it violently verity he exclaimed has that infernal i mean has mr chase been here again well he have sir verity said slowly he come just after mr longdale so i asked him to wait which he did then he come out again after a bit saying as you seemed to be busily engaged he would call again mm, did he seem to be excited verity well he did sir white and very shiny about the eyes and that will do go and call me a hansom at once derbyshire cried as he dashed back into the inner room here's a pretty thing that confounded american journalist chase you know him has heard all we said and has helped himself to my notes the whole thing will be blazing in the telephone to-morrow and perhaps half a dozen papers besides those fellows would wreck the empire for what they call a scoop awful longdale groaned what are you going to do derbyshire responded that he was going to convince the editor of the telephone that no alarmist article was to appear on the morrow he would be back again in an hour and longdale was to wait the situation was not quite so hopeless as it seemed on the face of it there was a rattle of wheels outside and derbyshire plunged hatless into the night offices of the telephone he cried a sovereign if i am there in twenty minutes 
The cab plunged on headlong. The driver was going to earn that sovereign or know the reason why. He drove furiously into Trafalgar Square. A motor-car crossed him recklessly, and a moment later was shot out onto his head from the cab. He lay there with no interest in mundane things. A languid crowd gathered, a doctor in evening dress appeared. "'Concussion of the brain,' he said in a cool matter-of-fact tune. "'By Jove! It's Mr. Derbyshire. Here, police! Hurry up with the ambulance. He must be removed to Charing Cross at once.' Two. With no spiritual indigestion troubling him, Mr. James Chase, late of the New York Chanticleer, now of the morning telephone, lighted a cigarette at the corner of Harley Street. The night was young, and there was plenty of time for him to mature his plans. He had got what he called an almighty scoop in his pocket. Indeed, in the whole history of yellow journalism, he could remember no greater. London dried up like a withered sponge, and absolutely devoid of water. London, with the liquid plague bursting from every subterranean pipe and fountain, were revolving in Chase's close-cropped head. He reached the offices of the telephone at length, and crawled up a dingy flight of stairs. Without knocking he passed the barrier of a door marked strictly private. The controlling genius of the telephone sat limp and bereft of coat and vest. His greeting of Chase was not burdened with flattering politeness. He merely asked what the blazes he wanted. Chase nodded sweetly, and drew a large sheet of paper before him. After a little thought he dashed in a half-dozen vigorous lines with a blue pencil. "'Things pretty slack lately,' he remarked amicably. "'So hot that even the East End can't rise to its weekly brutal murder. Still, you get on to a pearl sometimes.' Grady, my boy, what do you think of that for a contents bill? He held the white sheet aloft so that the flare of the gas should fall upon it. The tired look faded from Grady's eyes. He sat up, alert and vigorous. Here was the tonic that his fretted soul craved for. Chapter and verse, he said, speaking fast, as if he had run far. Got it all from Derbyshire, Chase replied. I overheard a conversation between him and Dr. Longdale in his own house. Also I managed to get hold of some notes to copy. "'It wants pluck,' Grady remarked. "'A scare like that might ruin the Empire. If—' "'None of that,' Chase cut in. "'Take it or leave it. If you haven't got the grit, Sutton of the flashlight will jump at the chance.' He held the contents bill up to the light again, and Grady nodded. He was going to do this thing deliberately, once he was sure of his ground. He remarked cynically that it sounded like a fairy story. "'Not a bit of it,' Chase said briskly. "'The plague breaks out on this bark, and the crew know it. There's no ceremony with sailors of that class. They just lose their vessel and strike for the nearest land. Knowing something of our quarantine laws, they make themselves scarce as soon as they can. A local doctor calls the plague English cholera, too much bad fruit in very hot weather, and there you are. Grady nodded again. The sweltering heat of the place no longer affected him. Down below the presses were already beginning to clang and boom. There was a constant clatter of feet along the passages. Sit down right away, Grady snapped. Make two columns of it. I'll get some statistics out for you. Chase peeled off his coat and got to work at once. Grady found the book he required and proceeded to compile his facts therefrom. The further he dived into the volume, the more terribly grave the situation appeared. The upper waters of the Thames were poisoned beyond doubt, and the Thames for some time past had been little better than a stagnant ditch under a fiery sun. Let that water only find its way into the pipes under London, and who could forecast the magnitude of the disaster? Nearly all London derived its supply from the Thames. So far as Grady could see, from a swift examination of Dr. Richard Siskey's valuable book, there were only two London water companies that did not derive their stock from the Thames. The New River Company, with its forty million gallons per diem, and the Kent Company, with twenty million gallons a day, were the favoured ones. But what of the other six sources of supply? 
Chelsea, East London, West Middlesex, Grand Junction, Southwark, and Vauxhall and Lambeth were all dependent upon the Thames. Some 250 million gallons of water daily were a matter of necessity for the areas supplied by the above-mentioned companies. Fancy that liquid poison flowing like a flood into the East End from Limehouse to West Ham, and from Bow to Walthamstow, and nobody dreaming of the hideous danger. Why, the great plague of London would be nothing to it. And the West End would be no better off. From Sunbury to Mayfair, those connected with the Grand Junction supply would suffer. So far as London proper was concerned, only those fortunate ones who were joined to the new river mains would be exempt from peril, and, even then, what chance has a sanitary area surrounded by pestilent districts? If it were not already too late, the only chance was to cut off the contaminated water supply, and then leave four-fifths of the population of London absolutely without water under a heat that seemed to deprive one of vital power. The further Grady read on, the more he was impressed. If he could get this dread information into the hands of the people before it was too late, he felt that he would be playing the part of a benefactor. Desperate as the situation looked, the telephone might yet save it. Professor Derbyshire had no right to hold up such a secret when he should have been taking measures to avert the threatened danger. It never occurred to Grady that Derbyshire had had this calamity before his eyes for years, and that his genius had found a way to nullify the evil. "'The figures are pretty bad,' Grady muttered. "'Upon my word, it makes me creepy to think about it. Got your stuff ready? Want anything?' "'Anything in the way of food, you mean?' Chase asked. "'That's it. No? So much the better.' because when that copy goes upstairs, not a soul leaves the premises till the paper is gone to bed. An hour later, the presses were roaring. Presently, huge parcels of damp sheets were vomited into the street. Under the glare of the arc lamps, perspiring porters, ghostly blue and spectral vans waited. The whole street was busy with the hum of high noon, and all the while, a little way beyond the radius of purple arcs, London slept. London awoke presently, and prepared for the day's work. There was no sign of fear or panic yet. A copy of the telephone lay on a hundred thousand odd breakfast tables, news in tabloid form for busy men to read. As the sheets were more or less carelessly opened, the eye was arrested by the scare headlines on page five. Nothing else seemed to be visible. The Poisoned Thames millions of plague germs flowing down into London, bacillus of bubonic plague in the river, New River and Kent companies alone can supply pure water, stupendous discovery by Professor Derbyshire, death in your breakfast cup today, shun it as you would poison, if you are not connected with either of the above companies, or if you have no private supply. Cut off your water at the main at once. What did it all mean? Nobody seemed to know. At eight o'clock in the morning, London's pulse was calm and regular. An hour later, it was writhing like some great reptile in the throes of mortal pain. 3. By ten o'clock, the authorities had taken the matter in hand. By some mishap, the one man who could have done most to help was lying unconscious at Charing Cross Hospital, with no chance of his throwing any light on the subject for some days to come. Derbyshire's hurt was not dangerous, but his recovery was a matter of time. Meanwhile, Dr. Longdale was the man of the hour, but he could not allay the panic that had gripped London. A deadly fear had taken possession of everybody. Longdale could hold out no hope, he could only give his conversation with Derbyshire, and declare that the bubonic microbe had impregnated the Thames. Did he think seriously of the danger? The answer was not reassuring. For his part, Longdale would far rather see a million troops and a siege train battering London than hear of such a thing as this. There was only one thing for it. It was no time for kid-glove remedies. Six of the great London water companies had their supply cut off within an hour. It is almost impossible to sit down and realize what this means, 
and that under a sky like brass and the thermometer at ninety seven degrees in the shade try and imagine it for a moment and try and wonder why the thing had not happened before think of two-thirds of the two millions deprived suddenly of the element which is almost as vital to existence as food try and realize that these two-thirds of six millions derive their water supply from an open stream that at any moment by the accident of chance might be turned into a hideous poison cup under a blazing sunshine after days of heat and dust the packed east end was suddenly deprived of every drop of water for an hour or two no great hardship was felt but after that every moment added to the agony before long the railway termini were packed with people eager to be away from the metropolis by midday business was at a standstill there was not a water cart to be seen from kensington to the mansion house every cart and tank that could be raked together had been dispatched into the new river and kent water area with instructions to convey a supply as speedily as possible to the congested districts east and southeast of the thames by lunchtime the city presented a strange spectacle well-dressed businessmen could be seen proceeding in cabs to the favoured area with buckets and water-cans with the avowed object of taking a supply forthwith cabmen were commanding their own prices fairly early in the morning came the announcement that mineral waters had gone up two hundred per cent in price by midday the supply for the time being had ceased men of means with an eye to the future had bought up the whole stock the streets were crowded with people anxiously waiting developments for the time being the scare was kept well in hand what men were most anxious to know though they dared hardly whisper the question was whether any disease had broken out as yet it was a little after two o'clock that the evening flashlight settled the question a boy came yelling down the strand with a flapping of papers on his shoulders the plague broke out he cried two cases of bubonic fever at limehouse dr longdale's analysis special there was a rush for the lad and his papers were gone in a twinkling of an eye he looked down dazed at the pile of silver and coppers in the palm of his grimy hand yes there it was right enough two cases of bubonic plague had been located in a crowded corner of limehouse and dr longdale had been called in to verify them he had not the slightest hesitation in so doing perhaps if the readers of the flashlight had known these two cases were renegades from the santa anna the panic might have been allayed but nobody knew there was terror in the mere suggestion of the plague doubtless people said these two poor fellows had drunk of the polluted flood and paid the penalty but no fever breaks out quite so soon as that and within a few hours nine-tenths of the white face multitude had drunk of the same stream man turned to friend and stranger to stranger with the same dread question in his eye it might be the turn of any one of them next there were those who shrugged their shoulders stolidly others that crept in bars and restaurants and asked furtively for brandy the streets were still packed with people waiting for fresh information by this time there was something like method in the conveyance of water to the affected parts but after all the new river and kent companies could not do everything at the utmost they could supply no more than sixty million gallons per day and now they were suddenly called upon for water for the whole of london just enough to drink and keep body and soul together was all that could be expected in some crowded districts where great breweries and the like had been established much was accomplished by private enterprise there were scores of artesian wells in east and south london and these were generously given over at once to the requirements of the people even private houses known to possess pumps were besieged and strangers of all classes were accommodated the situation was dreadful enough but it would be worse if a real panic broke out presently people began to press in dense masses along the strand and the avenues leading to trafalgar square where fountains by nelson's column were spurting high and clear there was a continuous rush in the direction of the square 
where placards announced the fact that there was no suggestion of contamination here. People danced and raved about the fountain, they fought for the water, they carried it away only to lose it again in the crush, they bent down and lifted the precious fluid to their lips in the hollow of their hands. Still, there was no sign of panic as yet, no more cases of fever reported. As night fell, the streets cleared, and something like a normal condition of things was restored. 4. It seemed, indeed, as if serious disaster would now be averted. All night long a willing band of firemen and volunteers were engaged in bringing the precious fluid to the famine-stricken district. But, including private and other wells, the available supply was little more than seventy million gallons per day, and this had to be divided among six million people over an area of some thirty square miles. And this, after all, was only a proper precaution. The New River and Kent companies had a face supply of fifty million gallons per diem, but this was an absolute maximum, and far over the average demand. Moreover, the drought had been a long one, and the reserve reservoirs had been freely called upon. In a day or two the allowance would have to be halved. Again in the hospitals and sick households, water for domestic purposes was absolutely necessary. Meanwhile, scores of the main-line trains had been knocked off to make way for trains of tanks bringing water from the country. The Spring Gardens officials were working with superhuman efforts. All night long a stream of people were coming and going between Trafalgar Square and such other open supplies as were available. Morning came at length with the promise of another sweltering day. A few people turned vaguely to Parliament to do something. Two days before the House of Commons had looked forward to prorogation on Saturday, but there was no talk of that any longer. The streets began to be busy again. There were smartly dressed men here and there, with grimy chins and features frankly dirty. It seemed strange to see individuals with good coats and spotless linen grimed and lined with the dust of yesterday. A steady breeze was blowing, so that in a little time the dust in the streets became intolerable. The air was full of a fine dry powder that penetrated lungs and throat, and produced a painful thirst. It was impossible to water the roads, so that the evil had to be endured. There was one question on every lip, and that was whether there had been any further spread of the plague. The authorities were exceedingly happy to announce that no further cases had been reported. There was comfort in the knowledge, and London breathed a little easier. Evidently, the prompt measures taken had averted all danger of a disastrous epidemic. Gradually it became known who the sufferers were. It was an awful price that London had to pay for the casting away of the Santa Anna. But that was the only spark to the powder after all. Extraordinary apathy and criminal carelessness were the causes of the disaster. The knowledge a century hence that London derived its water supply from an open river into which many towns conveyed its sewage will be recorded with pitiful amazement. For the present we have the plain unmitigated fact. The yellow press made the most of it. The red banner pointed to corruption and apathy on the part of the ruling powers. The red banner also asked if it were not a fact that our bloated legislators had a private water supply of their own, and that, whilst the common people were allowanced, our lawmakers were sipping their coffee and tea and whiskey and water as usual. It was the usual coarse jibe to be expected from a paper of that type, an arrow at venture. But for once the thing was true seeing that the House of Commons had a private supply of water drawn from a well of its own. As a rule, the banner carried very little weight, but the question got into the people's mouths and became a catchword. A man had only to pass a standpipe without a struggle in its direction to be dubbed a member of the House of Commons. That is, the public want did not touch him at all. The blazing, panting day wore on people were beginning faintly to understand what a water famine might mean. 
Everybody was grimy and tired. In the east and west alike dingy features could be seen. As night fell, small riots broke out here and there. People were robbed of their precious fluid as they carried it along the streets. It had leaked out that sundry shops in different parts of London had wells, and these establishments were stormed and looted of their contents by thieves who took advantage of the confusion. It was only by dint of the most strenuous exertion that the police managed to keep the upper hand. Another day or two of this, and what would become of London? At nightfall it became absolutely necessary to release some millions of gallons of the condemned water for the flushing of the sewers. There was danger here, but on the whole the danger was less than a wide epidemic of diphtheria and fever. And there were people thirsty and reckless enough to drink this water, heedless of the consequences. With characteristic imprudence, the East End had exhausted its dole early in the day and wild-eyed men raved through the streets, yelling for more. From time to time the police raided and broke up these dangerous commandos. A well-known democratic agitator came with a following over Westminster Bridge, and violently harangued a knot of his followers in Palace Yard. The police were caught napping for the moment. The burly red-faced demagogue looked round the swelling sea of sullen features, and pointed to the light in the clock tower. He started spouting the froth of his tribe. It was all the fault of the governing body, of course. They manage things much better on the continent. If you were men, he yelled, you'd drag them out of yonder. You'd make them come and work like the rest of us. What said the banner today? Your bloated rulers are all right. They don't want for anything. At the present moment they have plenty of water that you'd sell your souls for. If you'll lead the way, we'll follow said a voice hoarsely. The orator glanced furtively around. There was not a single police helmet to be seen, nothing but five or six hundred desperate men ready for anything. "'Then come along,' he yelled. "'We'll make history tonight.' He strode towards the house, followed by a yelling mob. The few police inside were tossed here and there like dry leaves in a flood. The quiet decorum of the lobby was broken up, a white-faced member fled into the chamber and declared that London was in riot, and that a mob of desperadoes were here, bent on wrecking the mother of parliaments. An interminable debate on some utterly useless question was in progress. The speaker nodded wearily under the weight of his robes and wig. The green benches were dotted with members all utterly overcome with the stifling heat. There was to be a big division about midnight, so that the smoking-room and bars and terraces were full of members. The speaker looked up sharply. A stinging reproof was on the tip of his tongue. He had scarcely uttered a word before, as if by magic, the green benches were swarming with the mob. It filled the chamber, yelling and shouting. It was in vain that the speaker tried to make his voice heard above the din. A glass of water and a bottle stood on the table before him. One of the intruders more audacious than the rest snatched up the glass and emptied it. A mighty roar of applause followed the audacious act. As yet the mob was fairly good-humoured, though there was no knowing what their mood would be presently. "'It's that confounded banner,' one member of the government groaned to another. "'They have come after our private supply. Can one of you get to the telephone and call up Scotland Yard?" Meanwhile the mob were inclined to be sportive. They surged forward to the table, driving the speaker back behind the chair. They overturned the table, and scattered books and papers in all directions. The foreign element in the company started singing the Marseillaise in strident tones. The martial spirit of it fired the blood of the others. "'We are wasting time here!' someone cried. There are bars and dining-rooms. As we came in I heard the rattle of glasses. This way! The crowd reeled back, as if one motion controlled them all. There was still the same note of laughter in the roar, and all might have been well yet, but for the advent of a small but determined body of police. They charged fiercely into the mob, and in the twinkling of an eye farces gave way to tragedy. 
In less time than it takes to tell, the police were beaten back with one or two of their number badly hurt, whilst the forefront of the visitors had not come off any better. The popular chamber had become a wreck. Outside in the lobby, broken furniture was scattered about everywhere. Then the tide of humanity surged into the bars and dining rooms. A few frightened attendants and waiters still stuck to their posts. The sight of the glasses and bottles of water about seemed to madden the mob. They demanded that all the taps should be turned on. The fittings were wrenched away amidst a perfect tornado of applause. Soon the floors were swimming with the element that all London was clamouring for outside. The rooms were strewn with broken glass and china. The floors were damp and soppy with the wasted water. Here and there men were feasting on looted food. Never had anything like this been seen in any Parliament before. A few courageous members, vainly trying to stop the din, wondered where were the police. But they were coming. They did come presently, two hundred of them, steady, stern and disciplined, and before them the rioters fled like chaff before the wind. Five more minutes and the house was cleared. But the damage was great. Outside, a dense mass of people had gathered, attracted by the news of the riot. They were in no mood to take the side of law and order, and it was with great difficulty that the ringleaders of the late affray were got away safely. A thin, high voice, a long way off in the back of the crowd, was shouting something which seemed to at once arrest attention. A sullen murmur came to the palace yard. The loose jeers of the mob ceased as if by magic. "'What are they saying?' an Irish member asked. "'I can't quite catch it,' another member said. "'But it's something about water in Trafalgar Square. I shouldn't wonder if—' Just for an instant the roar broke out again. There was a note of fear in it this time. The babble of voices yelled one against the other. Gradually it was possible to make something out of it. "'By Jove, it's as I feared,' the Irish member said. "'The spring under the Trafalgar Square fountain has given out. It's a public calamity. See, they are all off. No more row to-night.' The great crowd was melting away with marvellous rapidity. Each man there wanted to verify this new disaster for himself. The mob streamed along towards the square, as if life and death hung in the balance. If fortune had lain there, they could not have fought or struggled harder. In the heat and the strife, many fell by the way, but they lay there unheeded. The cool fountain no longer played. People, who had come from afar with vessels for the precious fluid, cast them on the ground passionately, and cursed aloud. The disaster was so great, it appeared so overwhelming, that the cruel mood of the mob was held in check for the time. Taking advantage, the police shepherded the mob here and there, until comparative quiet was restored. Dr. Longdale, on his way home, paused to contemplate the scene. "'Bluecher or night,' he murmured, "'Darbyshire or morning, rather. I'd give my practice to have a few words with Darbyshire now. I'll just call at the Charing Cross Hospital and see how he is.' It was comparatively quiet in the Strand by this time. Four or five stalwart constables stood on the steps of the hospital as a safeguard, for there was no lack of water there. A house surgeon came hurrying out. "'I am very glad to see you,' he said. "'I was just going to send for you. Dr. Darby—' "'Good heaven! You don't mean to say he is worse?' "'On the contrary. Much better. Quite sensible, in fact.' and he declines to think about sleep until he has seen you. 5. If the sweltering heat that hung over London added in one way to the terror of the hour, it was not without a beneficent effect in another direction. Under such a sky, and with a barometer somewhere in the nineties, it was impossible for riding to last long at a stretch. The early hours of dawn saw London comparatively quiet again. Perhaps it was no more than the sleep of exhaustion and sullen despair. Perhaps the flame might break out again with the coming of the day. Down in the East End a constant struggle was maintained, 
a struggle between the industrious and prudent and those who depended upon luck or the power of the strong arm. The day came again with the promise of another round of blazing hours. At first there was no sign of lawlessness, nothing more than an eager jostling stream of people pushing impatiently towards the districts where water could be obtained. These were the folks who preferred to get their own instead of waiting for the carts or tanks to visit them. Naturally the press was full of good advice. Thousands of correspondents had rushed into print with many a grotesque suggestion for getting rid of the difficulty. Amongst these ingenious inventions was one that immediately arrested popular attention. The writer pointed out that there were other things to quench thirst besides water. There were hundreds of tons of fruit in London. It came up from the provinces by the trainload every day. Foreign vessels brought consignments to the Thames and the Mersey. Let the government pour all this into London, and distribute it free in a systematic way. This letter appeared in three popular papers. The thing was talked about from one end of London to the other. It was discussed in Whitechapel and eagerly debated in the West End clubs. Instantly the whole metropolis had a wild longing for fruit. Some of the shops were cleared out directly at extraordinary prices. Grapes, usually sold at a shilling or two the pound, now fetched twenty times their value. A costermonger in the Strand, with a barrow of oranges, suddenly found himself a comparatively rich man. Towards midday crowds began to gather before the big fruit stores, and in the neighbourhood of Covent Garden traffic was impossible. Prices went leaping up, as if fruit had become as extinct as the dodo. Still the stuff came pouring in in response to urgent telegrams. It looked as if the dealers were bent upon making a fortune out of the public mood. Like lightning, the news of what was happening flashed over London, and gradually the approaches to Covent Garden were packed with people. Presently curiosity was followed by a sullen resentment. Who were these men that should be allowed to fatten on public misfortune? These things ought to have been given away, if only on the ground of mere public policy. Through the crush came a wagon-load of baskets and boxes. A determined-looking mechanic stopped the horses, whilst another man, amidst the yells of the crowd, sprang to the top of the load, and whirled a basket of apples far and wide. "'You've got too heavy a load, matey,' he said grimly to the driver. The man grinned meaningfully. He was benefiting nothing by the new order of things. He took an apple and began to eat it himself. In a few minutes every speck of fruit had disappeared. The thing was done spontaneously and in perfect order. One moment the market had been absolutely crammed with fruit of all kinds. An hour afterwards it was empty. It was a fairly good-humoured crowd, if a little grim, as yet. But the authorities had serious faces whilst quite half the police in streets looked shy and out of place, as well they might, by seeing that several thousands of them had been drafted into London from all parts of the country. Towards midday a sport was added to the amusement of the great mobs that packed the main streets. There was not the slightest reason why all London should not be at work as usual. But by mutual consent the daily toil had come to a standstill. It was grilling hot with a sun that made the pavement gleam and tremble in the shimmering haze, and there was little to quench the thirst of the multitude. But then did not London teem from end to end with places of public entertainment, where thirsts were specially catered for? Already sections of the crowd had begun to enter them and call loudly for sundry liquids. Why should the hotel proprietors get off scot-free? Mysteriously as the sign that called up the Indian mutiny, the signal went round to raid the public houses. There was no call to repeat it twice. Everybody suffered alike. The bars were choked and packed with perspiring humanity yelling for liquid refreshment. The men who were wise bowed to the inevitable and served out their stock till it was exhausted, and said so with cheerful faces. In the Strand the cellars of certain famous restaurants were looted, and one proprietor proclaimed that Whitechapel and Shoreditch had taken from him wines to the value of thirty thousand pounds. 
Men were standing in the strand with strange dusty bottles in their hands, the necks of which they knocked off without ceremony to reach the precious liquid within. For the most part they were disappointed. There were murmurs of disgust and wry faces at the stored juice of the grape that a connoisseur would have raved over. Fortunately there was little or no drunkenness. The crowd was too vast and the supply too limited for that. And practically there was no rioting where the unfortunate license-holders were discreet enough to bow to the inevitable. One or two places were gutted under the eyes of the police who could no more than keep a decent show of order and bustle about certain suspicious characters who were present for something more than curiosity. About one o'clock in the afternoon the early edition of the evening papers began to appear. They were eagerly bought up with a view to the latest news. Presently the name of the mirror seemed to rise spontaneously to every lip. Nobody knew whence it came or why, but there it was. With one accord everybody was calling for the mirror. There was pregnant news within. Yet none of the papers could be seen in the streets. There was a rush to the office of the paper. A large flag floated on the top of the building. Across the front was a white sheet with words upon it that thrilled the heart of the spectator. The panic is at an end. London to use its full water supply again. Dr. Derbyshire saves the situation. The mains turned on everywhere. See the mirror. What could it mean? In the sudden silence the roar of the mirror printing presses could be heard. Presently the big doors in the basement burst open, and hundreds of copies of the paper were pitched into the street. No payment was asked, and none was expected. A white sea of rustling sheets fluttered over men's heads as far as the strand. Up there the turncocks were busy flushing the gutters with standpipes. A row of fire-engines was proceeding to wash the streets down from the mains. The whole thing was so sudden and unexpected that it seemed like a dream. Who was this same Dr. Derbyshire who had brought this miracle about? But it was all in the mirror for everyone to see who could read. Very late last night, Dr. Longdale, the well-known hygienic specialist, was called to Charing Cross Hospital to see Dr. Derbyshire, who the night before had been taken to that institution with concussion of the brain. It may not be generally known that Dr. Derbyshire discovered the bubonic plague bacillus in the Thames, which led to the wholesale cutting off of the London water supply. Unfortunately, the only man who might have been able to grapple with the difficulty was placed hors de combat. We know now that if nothing had happened to him, there would have been no scare at all. Unfortunately, the bacillus story found its way to the office of a contemporary, who did not hesitate to make capital out of the dreadful discovery. The dire result that followed on the publication of the telephone we already know to our cost. To obviate that calamity, Dr. Derbyshire was on his way to the telephone office when he met with his accident. Late last night the learned gentleman had so far recovered as to ask full particulars of what had happened, and also to see Dr. Longdale without delay. Judge of the surprise and delight of the latter to know that matters had been already remedied. It appears that for years past Dr. Derbyshire has been experimenting upon contaminated water with a view to making the same innocuous to human life. Quite recently the discovery has been perfectly and successfully tried with water impregnated with the germs of every known disease. So long as so many great towns draw their water supply from open streams liable to all kinds of contamination, Dr. Derbyshire felt sure there would be no public safety till the remedy was found. The remedy had been found, and would have been made public directly when there came the now historic case of the Santa Anna and the alarming outbreak of bubonic fever at Ashchurch. On reaching the village in question, and on verifying his suspicions, Dr. Derbyshire found that the waters of the Thames were strongly impregnated with the germs of that fell disease. As a matter of fact, the sterilizing process was applied at once, and an examination of the water of the Thames a few miles lower down gave the result of absolute purity. 
This part of the story Dr. Darbyshire had no time to tell his colleague, Dr. Longdale. He was only too anxious to get away and prevent the issue of a scare leader by the telephone. Accident prevented this design, and when Dr. Longdale was questioned, he was bound to admit that he had seen the Thames water strongly impregnated with the bubonic bacillus. After that, there was no alternative but to cut off the supply from the Thames. Let us hope the severe lesson has not been in vain. Once these facts came to Dr. Longdale's notice, he lost no time. A special train was dispatched to Ashchurch, and returned quickly, bringing specimens of water from the Thames. These, after investigation, a small body of leading specialists drank without the slightest hesitation. The new process of sterilization, discovered by Dr. Darbyshire, had saved the situation, otherwise it would have been impossible to magnify the disaster. Did ever a quiet and dignified newspaper paragraph produce such a sensational outbreak in the history of journalism? Nobody needed to be convinced of the truth of the statement. Truth was on the face of it. Men shook one another by the hand, hats were cast into the air and forgotten heedless of the blazing sun. Up in the Strand, where fire engines were sluicing the streets with water, people stood under the beating drip of the precious fluid until they were soaked to the skin. Well-dressed men laved themselves in the clear running gutters with an eagerness that the pursuit of gold never surpassed. London was saved from disaster, and Dr. Darbyshire was the hero of the hour. The great man was sitting up in bed and modestly listening to the story that Longdale had to tell. Darbyshire was blaming himself severely. "'I ought to have told you,' he said. "'When I asked you to come round to me the other night, I had a dramatic surprise for you. I told you all about the fever and the state of the Thames. From the condition of the germs I knew that the trouble had not gone far. Here was a chance to test my sterilization on a big scale. I tried it with perfect success. I'll show you the whole process the first time I get back home.' "'Yes, do.' said Longdale grimly. It's all right as it is, but if you meet with another accident, and another such scourge comes along, and we don't know... I quite understand. When I had worked upon your feelings, I was going to show you the whole thing. Then I found out what that fellow Chase had got hold of, and I had to fly off, post-haste, and see his editor. I didn't mind the paper having its scare, so long as I came in at the finish with the assurance that there was no need for alarm. Hence my hurry, and hence my accident. All the same, it was a mean thing, Longdale. Some day, perhaps, the country will realize what a debt it owes to its men of science." Longdale looked at the yelling joyous mob outside, heedless of the sunshine and reckless in the hysteria of the moment. "'And perhaps the country will foster them a little more,' he said. Nothing but science could have prevented a calamity that would have multiplied tenfold the horrors of the great plague, and destroyed not thousands, but tens of thousands. Darbyshire nodded thoughtfully. One of the things that might have been, he said. Might have been. We have had a lesson, but I doubt if we shall profit by it. England never seems to profit by anything. It is one of the things that may be and there is more difference than meets the eye. End of Story 6 End of The Doom of London by Fred M. White Recording by Lee Smalley